All right, with that, um, let's get into, into, into the word. I'm, like I said, I, really, it's a privilege for me to be here, and really, thank you for having me. Um, genuinely, I think the Lord is just so kind in, in, in just having me in the space, and so I hope that tonight serves us well, serves us all. I'm, what I'm going to talk about is something, to be honest, that I'm still navigating and exploring in very fresh and new ways as well. Um, I'm packing for myself, and... Um, uh, I suppose Onen, uh, Pastor Onen mentioned that I'm doing my master's, so I'm, I just submitted my, 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 my thesis, so to speak, and, um, and this was part of the work there as well, that I was unpacking a whole lot more. Part of the, the focus was actually, um, or the, the subject matter maybe, let me clarify, of the thesis is I wanted to explore what, what a authentic um, and true worship is in a context like Africa, but in a church that's maybe birthed somewhere else. Uh, so, for those of you that maybe don't know, so I I I was actually part of the um, of Hillsong, um, and um, and so that's a church that's in multi-site, and so I was navigating and exploring for the longest time, like with a church like that, which has got a, a culture, I guess that's quite global, that's quite well known. What does worship look like that is truly contextual? And so I was exploring that, and so anyway, that's that's just something I've 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 had a really fantastic time exploring, and and. I think there's so much more to unpack in that. So part of what this is, is also has come out of that uh, as well. Um, and so this notion of awaken, I love it. So awakening to the wonder of God and your part in the mystery that is God as well. And I hope that that is uh, something that is sparked in you throughout this weekend. And I thought to start that with, like the message, the title of my message, if you're looking for one, is Praying With praying with, and we'll get to what that, uh, what that means, but I thought we would start in John chapter 4. Uh, it's, a, it's a passage which I think a lot of us would be familiar with, but I was reading this a few weeks ago, and I'm going to do it in a little bit of maybe of an unconventional way. I thought we'd just read maybe as much of the, of the chapter as possible. We'll see where we get to, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it, and then we'll move on. So in John chapter 4, uh, the words, I'm reading from the ESV, and uh, the word says the following. It says, when Jesus, uh, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, uh, near the field that Jacob had given to his, sons Joseph, to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And as you go on to read, so in essence, um, Jesus then goes on to tell this woman that, hey, you are, you know, go and call your husband. The woman says, no, I don't have a... And there's a whole lot that Jesus en engages with that woman. And in effect, what happens is that this woman is just like, my goodness, I've seen something incredible here. And she goes and she runs into the city. And she goes and gathers up people, and they come back to meet Jesus for themselves as well. Jesus witnesses to them or, or ministers to them. And in effect, what happens is that people says, listen... Yes, we might have come here because of your own word, but now we have seen for ourselves. So they encounter Christ through this particular experience as well. And when I was reading this uh, a few weeks ago, like it would be nice for you, you know, to do a deep dive, unpack all those kinds of things. But what I, what I noticed, at least in this particular instance, it struck me as like, here's Jesus. He's on his way from one place to another. He stops and the word says what? He was wearied, right? He was tired. And this woman comes up to him, and uh, he sees her. He recognizes her. He connects with her. So he speaks to her, 
And she at first is bewildered and says like, listen, but why are you talking to me? You and I should not have any kind of dealings with one another. But Jesus presses past that and says, hey, if you knew who the gifted is that is in front of you, you would be asking of me. So Jesus saw this woman, spoke to her, told her about her life story. He met her where she was. And as a result, her life was transformed. And it didn't end there. So she goes back into the Sydney or city, witnesses what has happened to her, what this experience was, and others come and meet Christ for themselves. And I mean, it's, it's an experience, it's a, it's a story that you've probably heard of before, but what I love about it is that Jesus, even though he was going from one point to the other, whatever it is, is that he still had an opportunity to connect with someone. He was on mission in that particular moment. So wherever he was, he still sought to connect, and he did it in a personal way, in a way that connected with her where she was. He saw her for who she was, and she responded to that. And this is an example that we see multiple times where Christ, wherever he is, he connects with people. He ministers to people. He is on mission. And that's something that I wanted to explore, this idea of mission, When you hear the word mission, what comes to mind? You know, you could be, all sorts of things could be sparked. You could be thinking a missionary, you could be thinking all sorts of things. But do you ever see mission and you on the same page? Do you understand what mission you are on? And so if we look at Jesus and say, Jesus, and and this idea of mission, I would want to say that it's something that is integral to who he is. It's ingrained in who he is. And so let's explore that for a few moments. I don't know if you would have heard this before, but this idea of the Missio Dei. And it's a, it's a theology, I suppose, that uh, people have different schools of thought of it and, and, and different ways of describing it. But I want to lean on, on what uh, the, uh, David Bosch, who's a, a South African missiologist, and a theologian uh, in his seminal work, Transforming Mission, says the following. He says that the Missio Dei is God's self-revelation as the one who loves the world, God's involvement in and with the world, the nature and activity of God, which embraces both the church and the world, and in which the church is privileged to participate. Missio Dei enunciates the good news that God is a God for people. So it's this idea that God is on mission. God is on mission to redeem the world. God is on mission loving the world. God is on mission to reconcile the world to himself. God is on mission himself. And that the church has the privilege to participate in this mission. Now, again, I mentioned a little bit earlier, people have different schools of thought of what this Messiah Day is. So for example, some say that God is missional and so they, attribute, they say that this is a characteristic of who God is. Being missional is a characteristic of who he is. Some other people say, look, son, it's perhaps better to say that God being missional is more of a metaphor. So it's something you can ascribe to God. However you want to look at it, at the end of the day, what we recognize and understand is that God is on mission. It's something that we see time and time and time again in scripture. Nihilus Niemand, another, another theologian, says the following. He says that mission precedes the church and calls the church into being. To serve God's purposes in the world, mission begins in the heart of the triune God and the unifying love which binds together the holy trinity that overflows to all humanity and creation. So it's something that starts in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's birthed within there overflowing into the church. Uh, Knutza says that God, so I love this, it says like, instead of thinking that, uh, we mentioned this idea of a church, right? So the church now participates in the mission of, of, of um, in God's mission. And it's the idea that, it's not that the church has a mission, but rather God has a church for his mission. So I'll say that again, it's not that the church has a mission, but rather the idea that God has a church for his mission. So it kind of lets you think, without mission, does the church exist? If you're not on mission, 
are you the church? And it's something to ponder and to think about. Bevins and Schroeder says the following. says that the church is a people, a communion, a sacrament of salvation, a sign and an instrument of God's saving presence toward and within all of creation. I'll say that again. The church is a people, a communion, a sacrament of salvation, a sign and an instrument of God's saving presence toward and within all of creation. So what is a sacrament? It's a symbol, it's a sign. So the church is that symbol, that sign of God's salvation. So again, God is on mission to redeem, to reconcile, to love, to do this, to do that. God is on mission and God has a church for the mission. And who is this church? That's you. If you are the one that says, God, I, want, I love you. God, I give my life to you. God, I follow you. You are the church. The ecclesia, the called out ones, it is you. You are the one participating in this trinity, in this triune God. As you participate within him, or as you partake of him and you participate in him, part of that is participating in that which he is doing that being his mission. So are you on mission for God? Are you intentional in being on mission with God? And it's not to, uh, this is my, by the way, what I'm saying now, it's not to, to say that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put a, a weight on you or anything like that. Rather, it's to recognize that, hey, if you're saying, God, I'm for you, God, I'm with you, then you've clicked the subscribe button to this as well. So are you intentional in what you're doing? If Christ is the firstborn amongst creation, Christ is the example to every single one of us, and we say that this is ingrained in who Christ is, do your actions echo what Christ has done? In recognizing that you are missional, we are meant to be, so how are you missional? Um, again, Niemann says the following. He says that discernment is something that's important, Right? He says that discernment is the beginning of mission, which results in a keynote, a keynote spirituality of self-emptying in service to and dependence on God. So this idea, and, and, and ask Richard Osma, who is also another author and theologian, echoes the same thing, speaking about prophetic discernment. And why is that important? In effect, it's saying, posture yourself in such a way that you are connecting with God and saying, God, what are you doing? What are you doing in this space right now? What are you doing in this environment right now? It is seeking what God is doing in this space and how you can participate in that which God is doing. It is through listening to God and to the world in its context that the will of God can be outworked in the world. I mentioned Jesus connected with the woman where she was at. He connected with where she was at. And Genuinely, this is my fundamental belief, is that you're con it is important to recognize the context in which you are. Yes. It's important to recognize the environment in which God has placed you. Yeah. It's important for you to speak into the space in which God has placed you. And it is important for you to move according to God's agenda for that space. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That prophetic discernment is the idea of saying, God, what is it that you are doing on the earth what is it that you are doing in this space and how can I be a part of what you are wanting to do in this space? So again, it's God's agenda and not mine. Participating in his mission. Um, Timothy von Arde, he, he, he wrote a, a piece talking about the missional church and looking at the church structures and, and, the, and the royal priesthood. Um, and he, he, he speaks this idea of, 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 of being glocal. Not local, but glocal. And uh, so that's with a G, G-L-O-C-A-L. And we'll get to what he says in a little bit, um, but he, he also roots it in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 9. And if we can read that together. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. There we go. Um, so, it says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And a little bit earlier in this particular chapter, um, uh, Peter was reminding the, the, the church that, remember, this is who you are. You are holy. This is the standard to which you have been called. This is who you are. And then he emphasizes again, says, but you are a chosen, uh, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. So that what? You may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So this is who you are. Remember who you are. This is what you are called to do. You are a royal priesthood. And this particular passage kind of reson is resonant with an, uh, a scripture in the Old Testament, right? In Exodus chapter 19, and we'll spend a little bit of time here. Exodus chapter 19, verse 1 to 6. The word says the following. It says, On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Verse 5, Now therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Now let's recontextualize, let, let's uh, find ourselves again. How do we get here in the particular uh, uh, part of the story? I don't want to assume everybody knows. So, Kind of back in Genesis, uh, let's take it from, God makes a promise to, to Abraham, I think it was in Genesis 12, says, you know, I'll make you a, a nation, now those who bless you, I'll bless them, and I'll curse those who curse you. And he, he, he says that he will make a nation out of Abraham. Fast forward, I think, a couple of chapters or some time later, however you want to interpret that, God re-emphasizes that particular passage. And in that point, God speaks about, hey, listen, I'm going to make this nation outside, uh, out of you. He establishes a covenant with him there and there again and says, listen, in the future, your people will be oppressed, those that come from me, but I will come and deliver them. Fast forward to a time that these guys, uh, the nation of, of Israel, they are oppressed in Egypt under Pharaoh's uh, tyranny, and God comes and delivers them, and now they're making their way to the promised land. And now we find ourselves in chapter 19 when they are en route. Okay, so very short summary of where we find ourselves. If there's anything wrong in what I've said, I think John can answer that. All righty. So at the foot of Mount Sinai, this is where we find ourselves. And God, a few things that we see happen here. God reminds the people, oh, reminds the people through Moses. He reminds them of who he is and what he's done for them. All right? Read that again. So he says that... Um, Thus you, shall, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. So again, this is what I have done for you. Me, the Lord your God, this is who I am, this is what I have done for you. And then he reminds him of this covenant. Okay? He says, if you will obey my voice, this is what is going to happen. So reaffirms, reestablishes this covenant with them. All right? And then he reminds him, says, you are my treasured possession you are mine, my chosen people, just like there in First Peter. You are my chosen people. And then he says that what? You will be a kingdom of priests. Quick second. When you've read the scriptures, if you have, what do priests typically do? You can go look into that, into the detail of it. But in a nutshell, oftentimes priests stand as intermediaries. Right? They stand as intermediaries between God and man, God, and people, right? So you'll see as intermediaries, part of what they do is they minister to God on behalf of the people, right? And some of what we see them doing as well is um, relaying or, or, or keeping what God has, has, has I suppose, has, has imparted and you know, giving them to the people as well. They sacrifice on behalf of the people, etc. So that's some of what we see them doing. Now, here's the question. If God had chosen the nation of Israel to be his people, but that entire nation is a kingdom of priests, then who were the intermediaries between? God and 
well. There had to have been people, right? And this is the idea that, that like when you see that God was on mission, perhaps long before we even anticipated, is that God's entire plan was to reach others beyond the nation of Israel already. So as they went into the wilderness or into the spaces in which they, uh, they were finding themselves, they were to be these individuals. In fact, Jason, uh, Jason Darucci, who's a, he's a, he's a, a professor of the Old Testament, uh, looking at this particular passage, this is what he says. He says that Israel's unique position among all the peoples of the earth placed certain demands upon them. Okay, but let's remember, these demands came after God reminded them of who he is and what he's done for them. Okay, and he says, like, if you obey my voice, this is what's actually going to happen. So it's not just a demand out of nowhere. It's built upon already the premise that God is present, who he is, all right? So Israel's unique position among all the peoples of the earth placed certain demands upon them. Second, because God had laid claim to all the earth and was calling Israel as an agent through whom he would make himself known, the peoples living uh, with a recognition of their special status before God would have served as a means for God's global sovereignty to be re-realized. From this perspective, we could paraphrase the whole, coming to that particular verse, he says, you can paraphrase it as such. Because I deserve allegiance from all the earth, I am giving you a sacred task, part of which is for you to exist as a treasured possession among all peoples. As you revel in my closeness and take pleasure in your sonship, you will in turn point the rest of the world back to the only sovereign savior and satisfier. And they will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So that's how how he paraphrases this particular passage. And there's a whole bunch of other scriptures that he, uh, he puts to this as well. So what was the role of the priest in the Bible? Uh, sorry, rather, he, he says that Exodus 19 verse 5 to 6 listen to this, builds upon the messianic and missiological plan set forth in Genesis, recalling the commission of Adam to image his heavenly father for the global display of God's glory. So now we see mission is not just now found in Exodus. He argues that it goes all the way back to Genesis because we are imaged after God, right? So it says it built upon the messianic and missiological plan set forth in Genesis. And this is how he explains it. He says, in Genesis 2, the Lord places the first man in the garden to work and guard the land. Terms used together outside of Genesis 2 and 3 only in relation to the function of the Levites as servants and guardians of sacred space. So in essence, what he says is that Adam was a priest of Yahweh. Because that's the first thing that he says. But God also charged the first man and woman to subdue the earth and to have dominion over its creatures. Royal language directly associated with Adam and Eve's role as images of God. So in essence, Adam was also a king under Yahweh, commissioned to reflect, resemble, and represent his father creator. So God was on mission already from Genesis, right? And um, we see now this idea that when he reaches out to his people, his chosen people, calls them this royal priesthood uh, or this kingdom of priests, that part of what that call is is, uh, is, 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 is part of mission, is to be on mission with him. Now we get back to 1 Peter chapter 2, what we read. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, so the same thing applies to you. That through you, God wants to make his sovereignty known. You are meant to participate and be this priest uh, to wherever you might find yourself. Right? Back to Timothy. So Timothy says, he says, the missional approach is a rediscovery of the priesthood of all believers and the task committed by the Trinitarian God. Missional is a way of being present in the world to be the incarnation presence of Christ to our neighborhoods. The modern day migrants uh, movement means that the nations and cultures have moved in, where? Next door. 
The laity and their task of the priesthood of believers is to participate in God's global dimension of the Missio Dei by participating and fulfilling the Great Commission by going next door. This does not mean that the church no longer has a mission, but that it is on mission with God both to the nations and next door. So again, this idea of mission is wherever God has sent you. Where you find yourself, you are a priest unto God. Are you representing him the way that you should? Are you conscious of who you are when you are in those environments? Are you discerning what God wants to do in that space, in that environment? And are you discerning what God wants to do using you in that environment and in that space? You being the church, do you recognize that God has you for his mission? So God, at all times, his plan was to reconcile the world to himself. Not a new concept. And today that continues to unfold. And we see this in Jesus. So Jesus was just being who he was called to be. Jesus set the example for us. And so would you do the same? So at the beginning, if I'm going to quickly, please tell me, because I have tendencies. I just, I can run. All right. But in the beginning, in the beginning, so, in the beginning, I mentioned and said that um, this title, the title of this message is, is Praying With. What does that mean? Well, why title that? And I mean, we spent this whole time talking about everything else. Um, it's actually a term that comes from a book called Praying With Every Heart, uh, written by a, a, a Brazilian-born um, liturgist, a theologian, um, yeah, the book is called Praying With Every Heart, and the term comes from that book, and it challenged me greatly, and in, in, we'll unpack that in a moment. Um, but I want to preface it with this, with, with this. There's this Latin term um, called, uh, it's, it says, Lex Orandi, Lex Credanti, Lex Vivandi. I don't know if you've ever heard it before, but in effect, it says, the law of prayer leads to the law of belief, which leads to the law of living. Sure. Or... In spirit, like the spirit of it says, basically, um, how you worship determines what you believe, which ultimately determines how you live. So lex, uh, lex orandi, lex credanti, lex vivandi. If you want the spelling, come chat to me. But again, how you worship will inform what you believe and what you believe ultimately will inform how you live. And I think that's true. Examine your prayer life right now. How does that shape what you believe? Someone can stand in front here or any other space and tell you this and tell you that, but what comes out of your mouth? What, what do you live by? How, or what, what's within you? What are those words that you speak to God, spoken or thought otherwise? What is pouring out of you? What is it that you believe? And how is your life right now? And what Claudio, um, what he says is that he, he challenges this idea of prayer. Um, prayer is supposed to be a, a fundamental aspect or part of, of, of our living as Christians, right? And oftentimes what we say, I'll pray for, I'll pray for, I'll pray for. And he wants to shift that a little bit and says, no, 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 we shouldn't just pray for, we should pray with. He says the following, he says that prayer is a spiritual exercise of the heart that can reshape and heal the past, can orient the heart toward a present of justice and peace, and can move us into a future of real possibilities for a life to endure. He goes on to say that to pray to God is to become that which we pray for. An answer to the problems and brokenness of the world it is to become God's merciful flesh in the world for the lowly, those without agency, without voice, without place. In effect, what he's encouraging and challenging us to do is to say, prayer shouldn't just be something that I'm praying for this and this to happen, but rather he advocates for a proximity to that which we are praying for. He says that when we pray, we should be close to those spaces and those environments that we are praying for. 
Or, and, and proximity doesn't also just mean by location. It says we should participate and be a part of God redeeming and bringing about change in that particular situation. So in other words, it's not simply, and I don't mean this in a, in a derogatory or, or diminishing way, it's not just about lip service, but it's about moving you to be a part of actually bringing about change in that particular environment, in that particular situation. So it's not just praying for, but praying with. It's having compassion and being moved with compassion to be a part of redeeming and bringing that situation to a change. He says that to pray is to take sides with the ones, uh, uh, it's with, the ones with whom we are bearing witness, protecting, giving ourselves, transforming our sense of self, changing our consciousness, telling the story from the perspective of the ones with whom we are praying. And then he also says this, when Christians are not seen as a danger to any of the powers that be, the church has lost its core meaning and purpose. And prayers and liturgies are only a perfunctory act of self-conservation. English. Yo! So if the church isn't seen as a danger to social ills, to things that are happening, to brokenness, then what's the point? Yeah. And you think about scriptures like uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan, um, uh, the Good Samaritan and, and being a good neighbor in Luke chapter 10, verse 29 to 37, you can go read it, but you know, Jesus being asked, hey, you know, what is it being a good neighbor? And Jesus speaks this parable and, and he, he talks about two religious people. So there's a man who was hurt in the road and two religious people walk past and do nothing. And then it's the Samaritan again, here's a Samaritan person who's an outcast or whatever, but it is this person, who's this Samaritan, who takes the brokenhearted individual or, or the broken person and looks after them or makes sure that they are attended to. And when he takes this person to the inn, even though he has to go, he says, listen, make sure that this person is taken care of and I will cover it. In his, he makes sure that this person is sorted and taken care of. And Jesus says, what? Go and do likewise. So don't just speak. Don't just pray, but do something about it. In Micah, the prophet says what? He says that, um, speaking to, to he, he says that uh, this, is, this, is, this is what is good for God. He says that um, do justice, love mercy or kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Micah 6 verse 8. I don't know if I gave it to the guys. But do you notice in that it says to do justice. Not to appreciate justice. Not to celebrate justice. Not to champion it and say, you're doing so good. But do justice. Love mercy or love kindness and walk humbly with your God. So this idea of justice or bringing restoration or turning situations around or tending to brokenness or all the... This is what we are called to. And I don't know if any of us has the liberty of saying, it's not for me. And again, I'm not speaking this from a place of I have arrived. Oh no. I'm saying, Lord, help me. And it's God's mission, right? As we said that it is God who's on mission and I'm participating. And the Holy Spirit plays a massive part within this as well in terms of how we can be on mission with God. But it's recognizing that I have a part to play. God is asking of me and it is a privilege to participate in this mission. I'm not saying it's easy, but God has me for his mission as well. And um, this is kind of what I wanted to, 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 to put to us, so that we see it in Jesus, such a natural thing within him. It should be a natural thing within us as well. Jesus was wearied, he was t and still he had time to do this. And as a consequence, an entire group of individuals came to, to know Christ for themselves. When you are tired, or you don't feel like it, but God is calling on you to do X, Y, and Z, what's your response? How are you participating in what God is asking of you? When you are called to pray with, what does that actually look like for you? How this has challenged me is again this, um, it, you know, you can give towards something, 
and you, this is me now, saying you can give towards something and say, oh, gift of the givers, or this and this, I'm, I'm so grateful that I can sow towards something, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, but it's also caused me to challenge, say, hey, do I see that as being enough? Have I seen that as being enough? Is that all that God is asking of me? And, and so I'm reflecting on this in, 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 in massive ways. I'm not telling you what to do, by the way, and I'm not here to judge and say, listen, it's just to pose a thing. Everything I've said, please go examine it for yourselves. But I'm saying I've been challenged. Um, I think with the state of the world uh, as well today, like there's so much brokenness that is out there that you can become numb to it. Right? You see somebody um, on the street, and it's just like, oh, that's just part of the country. That's just normal. The idea of compassion fatigue. But if that is an image bearer of God right there and then, not living in a way maybe that, that, that displays that or that is true to that, should you be playing a part in bringing that situation to a change? I don't know, I'm asking. There's an injustice that is unfolding in front of you or that you witness or that you are privy to, whatever. Is God asking you to participate in changing that particular situation? I don't know. Discern the situation. See what God is asking of you. And ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, lead me in this, help me in this. I'm your church, I'm your royal priesthood. May I be on mission with you and may you help me in this cause, amen? Amen. amen. Can I pray for us? Lord God, we, um, we see you in this space um, and we recognize uh, who you are. God, we thank you for just the privilege of being in relationship with you of being in communion with you, God, of participating uh, in, in just life with you, God, how you've, you've called us into, into, into this dynamic space, this dynamic relationship, Father, where you are pouring into us, God, where you are giving us life, you are giving us of yourself. But we also see, God, that you are a God that is moving, a God that is on mission, Father, and that you ask of us to be on mission with you. Father, I pray that you give us a greater revelation of what this means. I pray that you give us eyes to see what is going on around us. God, may our hearts, Lord God, bleed and, and beat as yours. For the things that are happening around us, for the, for the spaces in which you have placed us, God, may we discern what is going on. May we see with spiritual eyes, God, what is going on in those spaces. And may you help direct us in terms of what it is that you are asking of us, what you're asking of me in that space, in that environment. God, continue to remind us that you are with us, that you lead us, and so anything that we do, we don't do unto ourselves, or we don't do by our own strength, God, but that you do empower us to do this. Holy Spirit, that you have gone before us, God, that you have prepared the way before us, but that you ask of us to respond to you in obedience. Remind us of who you have made us to be, who you have called us to be. And God, may we glorify you continually wherever we find ourselves. Again, we thank you for the privilege of participating in this with you. And we pray that you be glorified in all that we do, in all that we speak, and in how we love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.